Good morning. So <clears throat> I am going to get ready for the day. I have a few errands to run and some things to do. But I thought that I would take this time to do a bit more with the Q&A and answer some more of the questions that you guys left. Any tips for when you don't want to practice? I would say if you really, really don't want to practice and you're not in the mood and you don't have anything coming up and any reason to practice, I would say take a break if you can. I think a lot of times if we are forcing ourselves to practice, we're going to end up frustrated and then we're not actually doing any beneficial practicing. And I think there is this like big culture of you know, feeling guilt around not practicing, this culture of like, oh, I spent all these hours in the practice room, oh, I'm dead, I've been practicing forever. Especially when you're in school feeling like when you're not in the practice room, there's somebody else who's still practicing and, and getting ahead, whatever that means. But I think that a lot of times that mindset can be very harmful. Sometimes, of course, we are not in the mood to practice and it just takes a little bit of getting started. I'm not always feeling elated about opening my case and practicing, especially if it's something that I'm not super thrilled about having to practice when it's something very difficult and there's kind of a barrier between starting. Of course, there are deadlines and things that we have to practice for. There are times when, of course, it feels more like a chore, like something that you do because you know it's good for you, like, taking your vitamins or eating vegetables that you don't particularly like, just these things that are gonna be beneficial for us. But of course, if you're in school and you have a lesson, it's wise to practice for the lesson, you know? And I think that you wanna take advantage of all the things that you have available to you while you're in school. But I would say, yeah, maybe thinking about trying to figure out why it is that you don't want to practice when, if you're not in the mood to practice. But really, if it is something that you are doing for the sheer enjoyment and a hobby, don't practice if you don't feel like practicing, you know? When it's your job or you're a student, it's a little bit different. But most of the time when I don't want to practice, I'm able to to work through it and figure out why it is that I don't want to practice. Maybe I'm dreading working on something because it feels very difficult and you know I, I'm procrastinating doing it because I don't think that it's gonna go well or you know just trying to get to the root of why it is that you don't want to practice. I would say it's a fine balance of being kind to yourself and trying to figure out what it is that um, is creating the resistance to practicing. Something that works for me is if I'm feeling really resistant, I'll tell myself, okay, I'm going to practice for the next three, five minutes. And then if I want to stop, I genuinely want to stop, I will stop and take a break. But a lot of times the hardest thing for me is just getting started sometimes. So I'd say maybe try to incorporate that and see if that helps. What ensembles were you a part of in high school? So in high school, I was a part of my youth orchestra, which I mentioned earlier. And I also was involved with marching band for two years, I think it was. Um, and then I, I stopped that after a bit because I just felt like it was taking uh, away too much time from practicing, especially once I realized that I wanted to go to conservatory and I needed to prepare for auditions. So I wasn't the biggest fan of marching band, but there were some fun moments in there. And then I also was in choir. Um, I would accompany the choir sometimes on piano. I preferred that to singing. I was in my orchestra, my school orchestra, my school concert band. I was in show choir for a bit. <laughs> A little glee moment, if you will. And apart from that, I did like county band and orchestra, district band, regional band. I don't think I ever went to state band. I can't really remember 
all of the different things now. It's been a while. But yeah, definitely had a lot of great memories from all of those things. What advice do you have for a musician coming from a small town that doesn't have many music opportunities and wants to become a professional one day? My school is very small and our band director doesn't help my situation much at all. So that sounds like a bit of a frustrating situation, but I think that it's it's definitely possible, especially in this day and age with all of the online resources. Um, there's master classes online, you can take lessons online. Of course, these things aren't cheap, but I think that that might be something worth looking into. Growing up, I had some great private teachers and I was able to travel eventually when my teacher at the time was like, look, it's time for you to, to get a different teacher, someone who can take you to the next level. And she was able to tell me when I needed to do that and I was able to drive an hour each way to my lesson every week. So maybe looking to see if there are any opportunities in a nearby town, I don't know if that's a possibility for you. So maybe looking to see what is in neighboring cities or towns, if that's a possibility. And I think that yes, a band director plays an important role, especially in the very beginning of your development as an instrumentalist because you probably picked your instrument with them they started you on your instrument but i think that that can only take you so far and that for better or for worse private lessons are really the thing that is going to take you to the next level especially if you want to major in music so i think if you can find a, a good private teacher that's able to work with you that that would be really really useful and you know growing up i didn't participate in any of the big summer festivals like going to buti at tanglewood and some of these other things that i didn't even know about i guess you could say i came from a smallish town in the in the way that i did not participate in for example like the philadelphia youth orchestra or any of these bigger things that were happening in bigger cities like going to juilliard pre-college or any of the pre-college programs so it's not to say that i came from a town in the middle of nowhere or that I couldn't have gone into the city to to take lessons but I think that I didn't really I was the only musician in my family and I think that this was all new to my parents and to me so but what I'm trying to say is that I think that it's definitely possible and if you're able to find a supportive community I think that that's gonna really hopefully help you out. So good luck to you. What has been your favorite part about your music career so far? And I'm sure you've answered this one before, but how long have you been playing? So I've been playing since I was 10 and I am 31 now, so a bit of time. <laughs> and my favorite part about my music career so far, I would say is just, I mean, obviously I've gotten the chance to play in some great places and you know, go to these top schools and work with amazing musicians and I think that's all really great. I've been able to travel, um, but I'd say that my favorite part is just the, the connections that I've been able to form with other people. You know, they say music is the universal language, which maybe sounds a little cheesy, but I think that music is an amazing nonverbal communication and just, just being able to connect with others and communicate in that way i think that's honestly the coolest thing and also just being able to connect with all of you here online in audiences in physical spaces at concerts i think that that to me is just that's the coolest thing i could get really emotional but i think that it's just really really incredible and i feel very blessed to be able to do that is blogging while practicing distracting or do you routinely record practice sessions for study slash review and coincidentally share some on your blog? Honestly, I don't record myself now as often as I probably should. If I'm preparing for an audition, I definitely spend a lot of time recording myself and listening back. I think that that's one of the best ways to improve. So if you're looking to take your practice to the next level and to also not waste a lot of time. I think sometimes we practice the same thing over and over and then if we just listened back and heard what we were doing, we would be able to identify 
exactly what the problem is. During some of the recording that I did in one of the past vlogs for preparing for the, the concert, I think that I noticed a lot of things in my plane listening back and I wish I would have listened to it before the concert, but I didn't get around to editing it before that. So I think that, yeah, it can be really helpful. I don't think it's distracting and if anything, I think it helps me stay on track because honestly, I don't wanna have a ton of footage to go through. So if I'm just kind of like messing around and not um, practicing in the most productive manner, I would have so much more footage to have to go through. So that kind of motivates me to stay on track in a way. Okay, so here's a four-parter. What is your teaching style like? What do you feel is important to include in lessons? And how do you teach things like beautiful tone online? I'm trying to think how best to describe my teaching style. I'd say that a lot of things in my teaching style um, are maybe dependent upon each individual student. So some of my students range from adult beginners who are just looking to have fun and to, to take up a hobby or maybe adults that are coming back to the instrument after a long time. And I kind of have to just gauge with each student, like if they want to do this as a hobby, I'm not gonna be telling them like, you need to practice X amount of minutes or hours a day and be doing all these scales and all that. But if they come to me and they tell me, hey, I want you to help me stay on track with this and I have these goals, then yeah, I can be a bit more rigid with them in terms of that. Obviously, I'm never going to lecture them <laughs> or anything like that. My teaching style is definitely not one where I'm like getting after someone, getting on their case about not practicing. I'd say I'm friendly and I am firm if need be to keep someone on track of their own goals. And then for my younger students or students that are trying to major in music, yes, with them, of course, I am a bit more like, okay, let's stay on track and stay focused with these things. But I'm not someone who's gonna yell at anyone. Um, I've had enough experiences with not my own private teachers, but knowing others that have really taken the joy and fun out of music making. And I think that that's never the teacher's job. My opinion is that the teacher is there to help guide the student and help them, you know, become the best version of themselves, become the best player that they can be, but by helping them realize these things that they already have inside them, these abilities that they already have. Obviously, I think it's important to be realistic about certain things, like the, the fact that a career in music is very competitive and very difficult, and it's not for everybody, but also that that doesn't mean that you can't have music be a big part of your life or that it can't be something that you study very seriously, even if you're not becoming a professional. And then what do I feel is important to include in lessons? I would say that once again, that goes back to each individual student and their personal goals. I really try to tailor everything to each individual student. So for the ones that do have the goal of getting into conservatory or um, performing at a super high level, we talk about tone studies, technique studies, tonguing, etudes. I think those are all super important. The more that you can really refine a lot of those skills, the easier it's going to be when you have to apply them to repertoire. And then with my students that are playing more for fun, definitely including pieces that they want to learn. I'm not going to force them to play a piece that they don't want to play, especially when they are playing for fun. So it really comes down to the individual and what they want to get out of lessons. And for teaching things like beautiful tone online, that is a bit more difficult, but I think that um, now since I've been online teaching since the pandemic, it is pretty evident to me when someone is playing with a, a good tone our ears have kind of adapted to hear these things over Zoom. Of course, there are things that are harder to distinguish in online lessons, and tone is one of them. But I think having been teaching online since COVID, that there are a lot of things that you'd be surprised that you can really pick up on, and I can tell when someone is using a good tone, even though it's through zoom i can tell with my eyes closed not even looking at the screen when somebody has their pointer finger down on their e flat their middle e flat so 
but I think it's really important for students, younger students especially, um, to hear examples of great playing in person or to listen to recordings, high quality recordings of examples of great playing just so that they can get this tone in their ear. I think that a lot of it is just listening and having that idea of the sound that you are trying to produce in your head. What do I use for editing vlogs? I've been using Final Cut Pro. I used to use iMovie, but there's just a lot of limitations to iMovie and I finally broke down like maybe last year, I can't remember when it was now, and got Final Cut Pro and taught myself how to use it, the basics of it. But there's a lot of good programs out there and if you're trying to start a YouTube channel, Definitely work with what you've got. I think iMovie is is fine. iMovie is great for the basics and there are some really cool things that you can do with it too, like making multi-screen videos and yeah. What is your normal practice routine like when you don't have to prepare for any orchestra performances? So I try to do a little bit of tone studies, whether it's plain long tones or a melody from the Moise book or really any melody. I'll throw some scales in there and tonguing exercises just to stay in shape and on top of things. For me, um, tonguing is very difficult and if I don't routinely practice it just a little bit each day, um, it quickly begins to go <laughs> and becomes um, even more difficult. So just trying to keep up with the basics, dividing my time between those three aspects, the tone, finger technique, and tonguing, and then throwing an etude in there, and maybe some orchestral excerpts just to stay in shape. Do you have any advice on how to avoid tension when playing flute? I would say being aware of it is the first step, and any moment that you do feel tense, trying to put down the instrument, seeing if you can release that tension before bringing it back up. Maybe also recording yourself, video recording yourself to see if you can identify what is causing the tension. Maybe you realize that when you play fast passages, um, you're tensing up your shoulders or your hands, something like that. Just being aware first is, is the first step. And if it's really something that you're struggling with, I would say uh, it could be useful to look into Alexander technique or body mapping, something that is going to help you bring more awareness to how you are using your body. At what point in your studies do you think you built most of your sound technique on the flute? Definitely in my undergrad when I was at New England Conservatory studying with Paula Robeson. She is just everything. Um, I can't put into words how much my time there meant to me and my time studying with her. If you don't know her, look her up, listen to her perform, watch videos where she's talking about sound and all these other musical concepts. She's just everything. So when I went to study there with her, I was fresh out of high school and it was a moment where I really realized how much went into making a beautiful sound and just becoming more disciplined and, and a bit more picky with myself with listening for sound instead of just playing and hoping for the best. Like I remember lessons where I would play, I'd start to play and I would play the first few notes and she'd be like, stop, listen, where's the beautiful sound? And that really just pushed me to always be listening to tone first and foremost. And I still, every day when I'm practicing, I think about the things that she taught me um, and, and the amazing ways that she guided me with, with sound and tone production. And I think that the awareness and the listening is, is the most important thing. It's the first step. Hearing that sound in your head that you want to create before you create it and applying that to everything that you do on the instrument, whether it's your scales, your etude, your orchestra pieces, it's all about the sound. She worked really hard with me on um, the Moise long tones. She was a student of Marcel Moise. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the De La Sonorite exercises and also some of the exercises in her own book 
which is an amazing um, wealth of uh, information on sound. We spent a lot of time in studio classes playing melodies, playing songs. I think that that was just incredible for all of our development there um, with tone and with sound because it, it all comes back to that. That's all that we have is, is the sound. And you might think, oh, that's just not complex enough to be to be just playing melodies in a studio class but really that was that was where we did all the work that was what really changed my concept of everything sometimes the simplicity and, and just going back to that to the root of everything to the root of music okay i'm getting nerdy and <laughs> enthusiastic and then can you briefly explain your music path as a student and afterwards as a performer and a teacher? So, I was born in 1991. No, um, <laughs> I started the flute in school when I was 10 years old, like I mentioned earlier. And before that, I had played piano. And I was already just very into music, into classical music, which is kind of a strange hobby for a kid my age. I had just always known that I loved music and everything about the arts and the humanities and I was just very drawn to all of that. I quickly realized that, hey, I'm pretty good at this flute thing um, compared to the other kids in my, in my group lessons. Um, I was really into it and because of that I was progressing pretty quickly for a beginner and then eventually when I was in fifth grade I started taking private lessons and then from there I just kind of kept going. I knew that I wanted to major in music. I knew that I had a huge passion for this. I wanted to do this forever. I wanted to study music at a higher level. I wanted to become a professional musician. So by the time I was in high school I started looking at different options for music programs, for conservatory universities and I auditioned for schools. I got into the New England Conservatory and decided to go there for my undergrad. Had the best time, learned so much. It was a huge um, part of my development as a musician and a human and everything. And then after that, I moved to New York to go to Juilliard for my master's with Robert Langevin, who is the principal flute of the New York Phil, amazing teacher, amazing player. And then I took some time off after my master's. I worked as a nanny. I was teaching private lessons, doing some gigging. And then I decided that I wanted a bit more structure. I wanted a bit more guidance and I went to Peabody for about a year and a half where I studied with Marina Piccinini, also incredible teacher, flutist. And during that time, I was also still gigging in New York. That was a stressful point in my life to be commuting from there and then trying to keep up with what I was doing in the city. I played in a Broadway show for a bit. I was still teaching my private students. And then since then, I've been here in the city. I think that often we have this concept that we're going to, you know, progress through all these stages, going to doing all these degrees, and then we're going to graduate and we're going to get an orchestra job or land a, a job at a university or whatever this big goal is that we feel like we need to achieve and that it's all very linear and one thing after another. Maybe for some people that is the case, that they, they get these jobs right after school and that they've always known that they want that orchestra job and they go for it and they, they get it. But I think that for most of us, that's not the case. And for me, there was a lot of struggle, a lot of self-doubt, um, some very dark times in there, but that I have, I think, come out the other end and am a lot more maybe at peace, feeling more confident and secure in my decisions that I've made so far and just where I am in my career. So yeah, definitely not linear. And as cheesy as it sounds, every day is a new possibility. And I think when you're so in it, you can't see uh, all the progress that you've made and things are still developing and I think that they will continue to, so. So that's the quick version of my musical life story.